Our next speaker, Dr. James Neuenschmander, or Dr. New, is going to be talking about biomedicine. I first met Dr. New last year at the MAPIN conference and was absolutely blown away at what I heard him speak about, so much so that we began taking our son and, and had a whole series of tests. And my husband and I still laugh because I literally have about an 18 or 20 page list of everything we've done over the last many years. And he's the first doctor we ever went to that completely got it. We walked in and he said, our son's name is Luke, and he said, I said, did you get a chance to read through everything? Because usually when we have a first meeting, the doctors haven't read through it and we're still going through it. And I'm irritated because I spent all this time and here, here's what's happening. And he looked at us, he said, what, you mean the book of Luke? <laughs> <laughs> So that tells you a little bit about his sense of humor. He's a wealth of knowledge. He's located in Ann Arbor, an MD that is just really has a lot of great information to share with us. So I'd like to introduce Dr. New. All right. When. Uh when Julie was setting this stuff up, uh, she, she said she wanted these uh, initial presentations to be like a TED Talk. So I had, I don't know if any of you all have seen TED Talks on YouTube or, or on uh, television, but I just had visions of, um, of uh, being Steve Jobs up here with my little uh, microphone, <laughs> wandering around a stage with three big screens on the back, talking about my latest iPhone. Instead, as soon as I walked in this morning, she says, you see that podium? You have to stay there. You can't move. <laughs> so excuse me if I move my head around too much. I know the sound is not the greatest. So uh, as she said, I am uh, James Neuenschwander, AKA Dr. New. Uh, please don't call me Jim. Um, and I have been practicing in Ann Arbor for the last 25 years. Um, my route to treating kids on the spectrum, um, and not, you know, when I say kids on the spectrum, my spectrum is not just autism. It's any problem with learning because all these things are linked together. These kids are gonna have the same problems. It's a matter of how much. And obviously because I'm a physician, an MD, I'm interested in the medical side of things for some reason, and we'll get into all this in this talk and a lot more this afternoon. There are many, many medical issues that these kids have that just are not being addressed. Uh, it is a source of frustration. My forehead is flat from banging my head against the wall so much. But 25 years ago, um, I figured out in um, medical school that most of what we do is merely to cover up symptoms. We put Band-Aids on symptoms. It's, it's great for job security because your patients will be your patients for life. You're never going to cure anybody of heart disease or hypertension or uh, ADD or autism or any of these sorts of things. And that's what got me out of the mainstream looking at what else might there be out there. And it turns out there's an entire world of information that they do not teach you about in medical school. And that's what got me started in integrative medicine. So I started to practice in 1980. 88. Um, yes, I'm almost in practice as long, but you look a lot better than I do. So, <laughs> um, and it was really what what I was treating was mainly adults, and and people would come to see me because they had seen you know this doctor, that doctor. They'd been to Cleveland Clinic and Mayo and everywhere else, and nobody could help them. And I would take a look at them from a functional medicine point of view and say, oh well, gee, you've got. B vitamin deficiencies, you have adrenal stress, your gut's messed up, we need to work on your diet, you have environmental sensitivities. Later on I learned about uh, other processes like uh, methylation and sulfation and again I'll talk about all this stuff in a lot more detail this afternoon. But I started helping these people and it was my wife that got me into treating kids because she had a, a nurse friend of hers who had a child on the spectrum who uh, she said, you know, how's your kid doing? She said, oh, much, much better. I th he's recovered. And uh, my wife said, I didn't know you could recover from autism. And what did you do? And, and this gal told my wife about, oh, well, we did uh, B12, we did chelation, we did uh, gluten-free diet, we did this, that, and the other. And my wife said, no, gee, that's all the stuff that new does. You know, when, when you are an adult and you run into trouble, you're not going to become autistic. You're going to develop chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, all kinds of chronic whatever syndrome, fill in that blank. That's what I was treating. 
And you know what? It's the same stuff with the kids. It's just they're being exposed to problems in utero or early on in life. And that's why they become, or one of the reasons why they become autistic. So at the time, I was already busier than I needed to be. My wife dragged me kicking and screaming into this world. And I'm very glad I've come here. So <laughs> I'm going to spend the next, hopefully, 15 minutes talking about biomedical treatments. And I just uh, subtitled there, uh, 15 minutes to expand your mind. I want to let you guys know there is a lot of stuff out there uh, that uh, we can do uh, to help kids on the spectrum. I love it when this thing works. Okay, there's the man, Leo Canner. And I just want to point out, um, you were talking about eyes. You know, Leo's got those eyes that are, that are kind of uh, cross-eyed a little bit, a little bit uneven. He's a, he's a good Jewish boy from Europe who became the director of child psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. And this was the paper in 1943, okay? Prior to that, nobody had ever described anything like autism. In 1943, he published a paper. And it was basically uh, 11 case studies. So a case study is just a description of the history of, of somebody, in this case, these 11 kids, eight boys and three girls, a little bit off on that four to one ratio, uh, which we know it is now. But in his paper, he said since 1938, so does that mean there was no autism before 1938? We really don't know, but it was unique enough that he took it uh, upon himself to publish these findings. You know, if I took 11 kids out of my practice and wrote them up and submitted it uh, to the Academy of uh, Pediatrics uh, Journal, uh, they wouldn't publish it. It's way too common now. So obviously this was a very rare disorder if it existed at all. But since 1938, I love his, uh, the way he started this. There have come to our attention a number of children whose condition differs so markedly and uniquely from anything reported so far that each case, and I hope, um, each case merits, and I hope will eventually receive a detailed consideration of its fascinating properties. Well, you know what, Leo, 70 years later, we're still waiting for that. These kids get a label, they get thrown into PTOT speech therapy, if you're lucky, ABA, and that's that. And that's part of why I do what I do and why I'm here today. There is a lot more out there. And Leo Canner let us know about that in 1943. This is not something new, okay? So in his descriptions, he, he certainly uh, described the symptoms of autism. He described the psychiatric symptoms of autism, the, the behaviors, the stereotypy, the, the lack of um, emotional contact, the eye contact, the socialization problems, and the language problems. But he also described the physical things that a lot of people have forgotten. So in his series of 11 kids, six out of 11 had digestive and feeding problems. Okay, 1943, six out of 11 had problems. One of them had a severe reaction to a vaccine. Now, it wasn't the flu vaccine, it was the smallpox vaccine, but still, he had a severe reaction to the vaccine. We know that that's something that happens in these kids. One of them had symptoms of mitochondrial dysfunction. What's that? Sorry, you'll have to see me this afternoon. <laughs> All right, and uh, one, of, not one of these kids at four and a half years old had not had any of the childhood illnesses, okay? So that's extremely rare uh, for somebody not to get, I know not in this day and age because we vaccinate for everything under the sun, but they uh, had not had chicken pox, they had not had measles, they had not had mumps, they had not had any of the common childhood disorders. And we actually consider that to be a sign of immunodeficiency. And again, you wanna hear more about that, you're gonna have to see me this afternoon. All right, on the bright side, for all of those of you that have children on the spectrum or grandchildren on the spectrum, he did mention that the parents were exceptionally bright and accomplished. So keep that in mind. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, I've, with, with all these genetics tests that we have out there now, I've, I've done some of my genetics and um, I always like to tell my wife when I do something boneheaded, you know, I'm, I'm just one uh, mutation away from being on the spectrum I'm, myself. I'm convinced if I was born today, I wouldn't be up here. I'd be in an ABA school. All right, so I'm gonna start by talking about the difference between psychiatric and medical diagnoses. Because when I talk about biomedical, obviously I'm not talking psychiatric. So psychiatry is, uh, again, flat forehead problem. Uh, psychiatry is one of these um, uh, conditions in, or uh, sciences in medicine where it's the only place where the patient walks in and 
tells us what the diagnosis is. So in psychiatry, we have uh, this book called the DSM, whatever we're up to, five or six or eight or 10 or 15, where they just randomly, not randomly, where they list symptoms. And there's major symptoms and minor symptoms. And if you got three of these and two of those, you're schizophrenic. And if you got, but if you only have two of those and three of these, you're bipolar. All right, it's not based on a biopsy. It's not based on a blood test or a brain scan. It's based on a history. Uh, there's some standardized testing that they do, but it's all symptom based. And these are just random lines in the sand that they draw. So it doesn't really tell me what's going on. And that's really when somebody uses a label like uh, your kid is autistic, your kid is ADHD, your kid is uh, ODD. I love that one, oppositional defiant disorder. What the heck's that? A kid that says no all the time. Um, you know, they, they're just making these things up. And every time they come up with a new DSM, they change the rules. You know, the latest DSM, they changed uh, how we uh, define autism. And uh, probably the rates are going to temporarily drop because kids are not, you know, that line in the sand has moved. And unfortunately, it makes it very hard to compare rates uh, from t uh, time periods to time periods when you change the whole diagnosis. But that's the, uh, one of the issues with psychiatry. Now, in medicine, you know, yes, we do histories and physicals and, and uh, we take, you know, there is some standardized testing we do. But a lot of our um, diagnosis is at least backed up with the medical side of things. We do blood work, we do uh, brain scans, we do biopsies, we do all that stuff to confirm the diagnosis. So, for example, in medicine, we, you come to my office and you have a fever and you have a cough and it hurts when you breathe and you're coughing up green loogies. I'm not going to say that you have fever, cough, green loogie chest pain syndrome. I'm going to say you've got pneumonia. And I'm going to confirm it by doing a chest x-ray. I'm going to do a, send a sputum sample off to the lab to show that it's strep or it's chlamydia or, or it's uh, mycoplasma or whatever kind of bacteria it is. And I'm going to have a very specific diagnosis. Now, the reason why that's important, if you have a strep bacterial pneumonia, you're going to respond differently to treatment than if you have a viral pneumonia. Okay? Same syndrome, right? chest pain, fever, green loogie, chest pain syndrome, but different treatments. When you take the psychiatric approach, you would have the same diagnosis, and what we try to do is group everybody into a diagnosis and treat everybody the same way. Now, even in psychiatry, there is a recognition that there are medical conditions that cause psychiatric symptoms. So if you go to a psychiatrist and you say, gee, doc, I feel depressed, and they run you through the rigmarole and they say, ah, you meet criteria for major depressive uh, um, um, disorder, thank you. Um, what are they gonna do? Well, one of the things they're gonna do is they're gonna check a blood count and make sure you're not anemic and iron deficient. And they're also gonna do thyroid testing because we know there's, it's really hard to distinguish somebody who's severely hypothyroid from somebody who's depressed, all right? Again, medical condition causing a psychiatric disorder. The other thing is if you're you know, walking around normal and one day you wake up and you're hallucinating, you know, maybe you're schizophrenic, but we're also gonna make sure you haven't run into, you know, that your wife hasn't slipped a little too much mercury into your morning coffee uh, causing your schizophrenia, all right? So <coughs> medical stuff matters. So why are we doing biomedical treatments of a psychiatric disorder? I alluded to some of this stuff, but you can read through the list there. Listen, it's really hard to go to school and learn when your gut's bloated out to here and your belly's hurting all the time. Or when you are waking up at two o'clock in the morning and can't go back to sleep. You know, when you're sleep deprived, it's just a little bit hard to learn things. It's hard to learn if you're having constant seizures that are unrecognized. You know, let's learn our ABCs, A, B, um, where was I? Oh yeah, A, B, yeah, you ain't going to learn very quickly if you're having seizures all the time. Hard to learn when you have chronic encephalitis. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about this stuff this afternoon. Uh, one of my beliefs is a lot of kids on the spectrum have inflammation of the brain. That's what encephalitis is. It's hard to learn if your body can't make enough energy. This is mitochondrial dysfunction, right? It's hard to learn if you can't sleep and on and on. So what are we talking about? This is an article uh, written in 2012. Uh, 
I apologize for bringing up articles, but this is where the evidence comes from. So what they did is they took every paper that was published on autism uh, and any of these um, uh, metabolic abnormalities between uh, 1971 and 2010. So you got 39 years of um, articles. And they looked at, uh, for a particular subject, of the articles published, how many of them showed a correlation between that problem and autism. So, in the case of immune dysregulation dysfunction, this is a messed up immune system, 416 out of 437 articles, or 95% of all the articles, uh, showed a correlation between that problem and autism. In the case of uh, oxidative stress, it was 100%. Mitochondrial dysfunction, 95%. Um, toxicant exposures, 89%. You know, that mitochondrial dysfunction, the big case that they had a few years ago uh, with uh, a girl being awarded a huge uh, award because of a vaccine injury, uh, the court said it was because she had mit a rare mitochondrial dysfunction. This is saying it's not all that rare uh, to find mitochondrial dysfunction associated with autism. Now. If you take your child uh, to the pediatrician because you're concerned that their behavior isn't what it should be and that they might be on the spectrum, and the pediatrician refers the child over to the neurologist, and the neurologist says, yep, uh, your child's on the spectrum, they, they have autism. You know, it's really important. They come home and, and again, what are they going to do? They're going to say, oh, okay, well, we need to get them in PTOT, we need to get them in speech, and, and again, if you're lucky, uh, ABA therapy. Uh, did they ever check them for oxidative stress problems? Did they ever check them for mitochondrial dysfunction? This is like the depressed patient that's not being checked for iron deficiency and thyroid dysfunction, okay? It's that important. You need to check this stuff out because if you don't fix this stuff, you're gonna have a much harder time uh, recovering that child. All right, so this is uh, an interesting uh, primer that uh, uh, this organization put out, Policymakers the, uh, Treating Autism Publications. So this is a primer for healthcare professionals and policymakers. This is an attempt to uh, uh, publish something that says, hey, this is what's going, out there, going on out there with autism. And they said there's areas of firm evidence connecting these things with autism, and you can read the list there. And for those of you who have uh, children uh, on the spectrum, uh, you're going to recognize a lot of these things. And remember, these things are all medically treatable. Uh, you help the stuff, you're going to help the child. Um, and again, you've got your mitochondrial dysfunction, oxidative stress, seizure disorders, autoimmunity. These are, are big ones, and we're going to talk about uh, a lot more of that this afternoon. So why am I doing this? Well, I already told you a little bit of that story. I'm doing it because my wife made me. But... This is a biggie, all right? This is a treating autism survey from 2009. 81% of parents and caregivers of, of patient, patients with autism and 76% of uh, the autistic patients themselves uh, did not feel that their concerns were being adequately addressed by their caregivers, okay? Over and over again, you will have a kid uh, go to the doctor and, uh, gee, you know, my, my child is having uh, chronic diarrhea. Oh, that's the autism. You know, why is my kid sick all the time? Oh, that's the autism. You know, why, why do they have uh, all these problems with uh, allergies? Oh, that's their autism. Really, I think we can do better than that. All right. This is also from the same paper. Symptoms and behaviors that frequently occur in autism have been erroneously assumed to be a result of autism itself. So this is the list of things that Doctors will say, oh, that's the autism. Anxiety, aggression, agitation, irritability, impulsivity, lack of focus, disturbed sleep, self-harming and self-stimulatory behaviors, lack of coordination, visual, tactile, and auditory oversensitivity, all right? All of these things are just blamed on the autism, but you know what? There may be biomedical reasons for this stuff happening. You're not going to fix a mitochondrial disorder with ABA therapy. All right, just like you're not going to fix a hypothyroid state with Prozac. All right, I think I've been ranting enough, but I'm going to rant some more. All right, we have an epidemic. All right, I, I trained at the University of Michigan, 1981 to 1985. That's when I went to medical school. And then I spent uh, three years in a uh, residency program there. In that time, I saw exactly zero cases of autism, zero, okay? This was in the early 80s. I know that's a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. You know, we started with 
maybe zero cases prior to 1938. Uh, it used to be one in 10,000, then one in 5,000, then one in 122. Uh, the last numbers are somewhere in the one in 50 range. They did a study in South Korea where they just went into a town of 100,000, interviewed every kid in that town, and came up with a number of one in 37. You know, what's it going to take? What are we spending the money on? I mean, this is a really good question, because they do spend money on autism research. It's pathetic compared to what they spend on childhood AIDS and leukemia and these kinds of things. I'm not, I'm not saying those things are not important to spend money on, but look at the numbers. You know, where are the cases? Where are we spending money on? What do they spend money on? Most of the money has gone to research on genetics. And again, God bless them for doing it. But you know what? If we had an epidemic, if we had an outbreak of, of malaria in Michigan, I'm pretty sure the CDC is not going to send a crack team of geneticists to figure out why, right? They're going to send epidemiologists. What's causing the problem? And more importantly, what do we do about stopping it? Where's that research, okay? In the last five years, if you look at the number of articles that are published on autism, and there's a lot, something like 53 or 54% of them, we're still on genetics, okay? Yes, I, I don't know of any other um, genetic um, epidemic that we've had before. You know, all the genetic childhood disorders like Down syndrome, they haven't changed. Those numbers are the same as what they were 20, 30, 40 years ago, all right? And they certainly haven't gone from whatever it was 30 years ago, one in 5,000 or one in 2,500 to one in 30. You know, what's it gonna take? And why is all this resistant to biomedical treatments, okay? I am ostracized by both sides of the equation here. I get ridiculed by the medical people, the pediatricians. Oh, that stuff doesn't work. Oh, whatever you do, don't change the diet, okay? No, I'm telling you, I've had patients come to my office. Pediatrician says, great, why don't you go see Dr. New? I think that's a great idea. But whatever you do, don't change their diet. That's dangerous. We're not distributing this, right? Okay. <laughs> yes, we, we have an expert in the audience that we'll be talking about that. All right. Um, so I get, I get hit from my colleagues. You know, none of that stuff works. Even though I'll show you this afternoon, there's plenty of evidence out there. It's just nobody's reading those articles. Those things are not making, you know, the Journal of Pediatrics, the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. You know, they're going to be published in the Journal of Nutrition. They're going to be published in the, you know, the New Delhi Journal of Indian Herbs or something, you know, they're, they're not going to be brought to the attention of mainstream doctors. And I get it from the other side of the equation, too. You know, we own an ABA center. I believe in ABA. I think it makes a big difference for kids on the spectrum. But there are um, people on the biomedical side that don't like ABA. You know, what are you doing uh, using ABA? You know, what I do will get, will help that brain get to the place where it can learn but you still have to teach. And that's part of what ABA is all about. All right, so 70 years since uh, Leo Kanner said we should investigate the uniqueness of all of these cases. 70 years of research. What have we got? Abilify and Risperdal, and actually they took Risperdal off the list. And neither of those things treat autism. All they treat is agitation, aggression, violent behavior. They do not treat autism. 70 years, we have nothing. You know what? It's a crisis. You know, we're losing our kids. Give it another two generations, it's not going to be one in 37. It's going to be one in five, one in two. It's going to be everybody. I was just joking earlier today. It's going to be great for me because, you know what? I'm going to shift way up on that percentile range on intelligence because you're going to have all these kids down here. You know what? What's it going to take before we do something? So, time to do something. Thank you.